take you out to the picture well, I hope you'll come and see me in the movies What a scene of your Hollywood song Hello, and welcome to the Beatles Films Podcast. I'm Matt Looker. I'm Ed Williamson. We're both professional film writers and Fab Four fans, and each week we discuss a different movie about starring or inspired by the Beatles. This week, that film is Stuart Sutcliffe, The Lost Beatle, originally broadcast on BBC4 in 2005, and at time of recording at least, available to watch for free on YouTube. This hour-long documentary profiles famed fifth Beatle Stuart Sutcliffe, with a strong emphasis on his time playing with the band during their Hamburg years, his relationship with Astrid Kircher, his success and future potential as a talented artist, and his untimely death from a brain hemorrhage at the age of 21. Personally, before watching this, I feel like everything I knew about Stuart Sutcliffe had been informed entirely by the film Backbeat, which we covered in an early episode. But at the start of this film, we have a talking head, Professor Donald Cuspit, who is an art critic and historian, who says that the Beatles' connection with Stuart Sutcliffe is entirely incidental, which is a really nice way of suggesting that actually that is the least interesting thing about Stuart and actually that his talent as an artist is the real focus that we should have here. I do feel like that then leads into an hour-long documentary about Stuart playing with the Beatles. I don't know how you felt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, I agree with him. I, I'm I'm really into Stuart Sutcliffe for the art. You know, I don't I don't really care about the yes, Beatles so stuff. You know, I, I didn't even know he was in the Beatles to be honest. Until until the only I reason this. I'm on his podcast is I thought it was a Stuart Sutcliffe podcast. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I think that uh, one of the things this documentary does get across quite well is that Stuart was remarkable. So no, no one ever, no one makes a documentary about Pete Best and says like, actually, this guy had you know a lot, a, a lot of talents and and all the rest of it. You know, like Pete Best, he made a contribution to the Beatles story and that shouldn't be ignored. But you know, it, in the nicest possible way, no one is sort of saying like Pete Best was like a great lost genius. You know, mm. Stuart Sutcliffe. Partly because his story is so perfect, because, of course, he died, but partly because, you know, there's a mythos about him because of this. It does seem like one of the most remarkable things, of many remarkable things about the Beatles is the, the sheer coincidence of it all, that the four of them happened to grow up within about five miles of each other and happened to meet at exactly the right time. It's ridiculous that those people... Should have ever met. It's a ridiculous coincidence. The amazing thing about uh, Stuart Sutcliffe is that it, he was just as remarkable. It seems mm -hmm. you know he had different. His talents were more artistic than they were musical. But th this was someone who would have made uh, certainly. This film is suggesting who would have made a really significant artistic contribution, um, not to the Beatles necessarily, but to the world um, if if he had lived. And so I think the film gets that across quite well. And when you talk about him having a, a perfect story, uh, in part because he died so young, yeah. Do you, you know, what do you mean by that? In in sense that it's it's a sort of neatly encapsulated life. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, um, you know, I mean, I don't want it to sound callous, you know, but, <laughs> but, that, but that's, I guess that's what, I, what I'm trying to <laughs> trying to unpick a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think um, it's one of those many things about the Beatles story that just kind of seems to be written in the stars in a way, in that sort of or almost forgotten right at the start of this story. It, it is a story of two friends. You know, it sort of like, it feeds into the mythos of John Lennon to some degree as well because of, uh, you know, he sort of experienced a, a lot of death and a lot of trauma early on in his life, you know, and this being like Stuart was his, his best friend by all accounts, you know, and um, so much of the Beatles story revolves quite rightly around the relationship between John and Paul. And actually the relationship between John and Stuart seemed at that point in his life seemed to be just as if not more important you know and I, you know we mentioned in our episode where we discussed backbeat that the, the that film makes a very pointed reference to how paul then takes on the mantle of john's best friend yeah um and, and in a very sort of deliberate referenced way yeah um replacing Stu like as his sort of best friend i didn't mean to sound facetious by suggesting that the only thing i know about Stu Sutcliffe comes from backbeat but <laughs> i think you know what you just said there goes to show that actually it's quite surprising that there isn't more made of that early part of the Beatles story and there isn't more investigation into Stu Sutcliffe's contribution to the band but also you know his potential as, a, as an artist it doesn't feel like that's a story that's often told 
Yeah, right. And um, because th- this is sort of what I'm trying to get across is that if the Beatles had just gone on to be Herman's Hermits and had just ha- had like three big singles and then you'd never heard of them again, like yeah. th- th- their own story would have been sort of worthy of a documentary film, but also Stuart's story would still have been worthy of a documentary film yes. because it's fascinating. So it's ridiculous that a story this fascinating happens before they even get going and before anyone's even heard of them. Mm. And then they do everything that they do. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's, it's kind of, it feels like it's on par with like an Ian Curtis type story yeah. only with the band then going on to an even greater popularity and success yeah. after the fact. You know? Right, right, yeah. Do, do you think this film does justice to that story? that story and does justice to uh showing Shu Sutcliffe in the in the right light. Uh I think uh it makes some quite specific choices. Uh so I mean by the way, I don't know which is the right light in which to show Stuart Sutcliffe, but of course that's kind of uh, documentaries can contribute to that. As we talked about in the backbeat episodes, uh the way we think about Stuart Sutcliffe was more influenced by backbeat than anything else certainly mm. when when we were younger when we were teenagers i think and um this film really fills in quite a lot of gaps i think certainly one of the things i really noticed was that there's so many pictures of him in this that i either hadn't seen before or had only seen very rarely because mm. there's two or three very well known ones you know the sort of the yep. ones that astrid took and then the, the loads of others that I just wasn't at all familiar with, um, because I because I, I I was sort of under the impression that there was very very little footage of him. There's certainly no video and no audio of him. And Klaus Vorman says that, doesn't he? In, in yeah. the film, he says that the thing that he's most sad about is that there is no footage of this man. Yeah. Um, and and that sort of has gone undocumented. Yeah, and it and I think that the the whole thing adds up. Uh, to to the mythos in a way in that he he just gives the impression that these pictures and especially Astrid's um, style of photography has resulted in these images where he seems quite a sort of spectral presence and quite ethereal, uh, Mm. otherworldly. There's one in particular where it's a picture of the two of them and he is sort of kissing her cheek with his eyes closed and he looks, uh, and, and it's like a sort of Victorian death mask picture or some or something like that or mm. sort of reminds you of it you know and th- you're sort of left with this impression that he was a sort of beautiful shadow you know i was struck by the fact that he was a very handsome man yeah and i i guess i you know i have seen some of those more uh popular pictures of, of him but there were some images here of him where he seems like an absolute model yeah and in a way that is different to the rest of the band because i think that when we think about the Beatles and how they looked in their Hamburg years, they're still growing into their looks. Yeah. A lot of time, apart from Paul, who just always looked like a cute boy. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Whereas he is a fully formed, like piercing glaze model. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he talks in this film, uh, in his letters, you know, there's an actor who voices over uh, his letters uh, as if he were Stu reading them. Um, he talks about how, you know, he's suddenly finding himself attractive to women and how that is a surprise to him because he is was always the weedy kid at school yeah recently i've become very popular with both girls and homosexuals who tell me i'm the sweetest most beautiful boy imagine it me the one who had such a complex because i was small and thought i was ugly it appears that people refer to me as the james dean of hamburg I'm quite flattered. And then you look at these pictures, it's like, I just don't believe that. You look like you were destined to be a movie star or, yeah. you know, a, you know, like a model. Again, like I say, and I think that does, he's, he's also got that level of attractiveness that is right, does feel a little bit ethereal. It's almost slightly otherworldly. Yeah. It's very striking. Yeah. But going back to the question you asked me um, approximately three weeks ago uh, <laughs> um, Finally. Uh, uh, about um, uh, about whether the film is sort of getting across the 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 artistic nature uh, and the value of his art uh, as against just the, the significance of his having been a Beatle one of the things about art is it is quite difficult to depict in film I, I mean documentary in particular is that because really really all you can do is like show the paintings and have an art expert say these are really good paintings you know which is mainly what they do it's quite difficult to sort of express 
Uh, you know, so if you think about how Backbeat did it, so there, there was a few there's a few scenes where he's kind of painting in like quite a frenzied way, mm. uh, which according to this documentary is actually quite true to life. He did paint like sort of late into the night and then would kind of fall asleep exhausted in a chair, that kind yeah. of thing, you know. And so they they kind of associate that with a sort of uh, restlessness in him and they t- they turn it into a sex scene as well, I think, don't they? They where, do, like, yes. He and Astrid right. are sort of painting each other. Um, if you remember like um, in The Talented Mr. Ripley, the character of Dickie Greenleaf uh, is a jazz uh, musician and mm. that's like the thing Tom Ripley kind of uh, pretends to be interested in jazz in order to sort of get to know him uh, in, in the book Dickie Greenleaf was a painter he was really interested in painting right. but I think the decision made was like that's really hard to depict on film just like he's standing there he's done a painting and it's like hey good painting yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. like yeah. you can't do uh, jazz is obviously uh, music in general is obviously a lot easier to do you know and so it, it, in a bit of a roundabout way what I'm saying <laughs> finally it, it, <laughs> four it, weeks it, in counting <laughs> is that um, it, it, it is quite hard to get get that across now, now obviously like naturally most of the people watching this documentary are watching it because he was a Beatle. Yes. Right. So, so it knows which side its bread is buttered. It knows that people want Beatles stuff. But, uh, but yes, I do think it probably goes a little bit too far. I think there's, so there's a few points to unpack there. I think one is that uh, I do find that in this film, there are quite uh, lengthy chunks uh, of time devoted to stuff that the Beatles did generally. Yeah without specifying exactly Stu's involvement in that or focusing purely on him. And that's where I feel like it's starting to lose its way a little bit. Yeah. I also think that where we do have discussion of uh, Stu as an artist, it does talk about the the style of art in which he paints and the method he adopts um, when, in, in approaching his paintings. I think what I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of is... Uh, an interpretation of his art. Yeah. It feels like th- there's a surface level approach to his output as a painter. Yeah. This is basically here are some of his paintings and here's how he categorized them as yeah. opposed to why they work, why they are deemed significant, yeah. why they are effective as a painting. So I think there's a bit of a missed opportunity to do a bit of a deeper dive in why we should believe that he would have had a very successful career as a painter. Yeah. Um, but also, equally, I completely agree with your point. I actually happen to really like his art. I wouldn't know about it if it wasn't for the fact that he was in the Beatles. No, like, not. And, yeah. and I think that that's... Uh, I, and I think that there, you know, we have to make allowances for the fact that this film is always going to be capitalising on his connections to the Beatles, even though it's stated up front that that shouldn't be done. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's a funny approach to take, isn't it? Um, there, there is a bit like sort of, I think it's maybe towards the end where they talk a bit about how the, like the, these are the paintings he was doing towards the end of his life. Mm. And then, but th- there's a lot of surface level detail applied to that where like suddenly you're seeing one that is mainly sort of charcoal black and grey. And, and, and they kind of say like... Um, yeah, he was like this was the sort of mood he was in towards the end of his life when he was, you know, he was having like very bad headaches the whole time because you know because of the brain hemorrhage and um, and you think well well yeah like I could, <laughs> like yeah. I'm not an art critic but I think I could have got that <laughs> like yes. on my own you know yeah um, but it, yeah it's uh, I don't know it, it's the, the funny thing is is that like this was. I don't know about made for, but broadcast on BBC Four. B- BBC Four, like for for anyone who's not in the UK, um, is a sort of is a BBC channel that is very very arts and culture based and sort of interesting sort of intellectual documentaries. That's very much what its remit is, and so it is absolutely fair to say it's a sort of liberal intelligentsia audience, and I and that audience, I think would actually be pretty forgiving of a decision to talk in more depth about his art and and, and even to have like more than one art critic or historian on there and yeah. sort of you know and sort of uh, talking about different interpretations and there there to be sort of less Beatles stuff in general um so I'm not I'm not saying that that is a mistake or a misstep but actually I think uh the audience certainly would have tolerated it but but I think I think what all of this goes back to is this documentary is 
Stuart Sutcliffe, The Lost Beetle. Yeah. And I think what we end up with in, in this documentary is is a film that doesn't really know quite where to place its focus. Yeah. It's in the title, right? Like <laughs> if you wanna if you're going to talk about him as a lost beetle, talk about him as his relationship to the band, you know, essentially with the backbeat story. That none of that is explored in great depth. But on the on the flip side, neither is his work as an artist. And it's it, the film doesn't necessarily know how to do one or the other particularly well, I think. Yeah, that's true. Talking about how this film uh, aired on a channel that was predominantly arts and culture focused and primarily for, I think you described it as liberal intelligentsia. Yes. Let's talk about some talking heads sure. that appear in this film. Um, I think there were some surprising title captions that come up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are some people that I haven't heard of before. Yeah. Um, some people have a peripheral connection to the band in their early years. Mm-hmm. Other people who are just former barmaid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did you know, have you, or did you have any reason to believe that Rosie McGinnity, I think her name is, um, has a particularly insightful take on the band at this point no i've never heard of her but but i i presume if i if i went and looked at the index of tune in by mark lewis and she's yes. probably in there so if she was a, if she was a barmaid at uh one or more of the clubs where they worked then she would have been there a lot and seen quite a lot I'm yeah sure, you know. i mean I, like i say i don't i don't mean to downplay her role but no, no. having seen a lot of beatles documentaries in the past it's quite surprising how this film seems to have an entirely different section of um of talking heads than i think we've seen in any other documentary yeah there's not much overlap with others that we've seen yeah it's um there's a bit of a subset of uh, the complete beatles which also has alan williams and horst facher in it yeah astrid kirscher is also in george harrison living in the material world yeah i think which was a bit of a surprise but as we said i think scorsese kind of managed to tempt a lot of people who don't generally uh, don't generally do a lot of talking head stuff so I think it's, as much as anything else, it is just these are the people who were around at this point in their career. Yes. So I wonder whether... I'm just thinking, like, Pete Best, you don't really see him do a lot of talking head no. stuff in general, do you? He was in the Sergeant Pepper one, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. That's true. Yeah. That's true. But no, not many others. You're right. It, it, it will depend, because there was a time when Pete Best really didn't want to talk about the Beatles. Mm. And then I think from about anthology time onwards when he'd sort of got his first proper payday from it and i think he was sort of you know ha- happier just to sort of be be involved in things uh and, and talk about things so like you know he had, did go on american chat shows and things but generally was not a guy who was popping up in every documentary going yeah which he could have been absolutely forgiven for you know yeah uh, and you know it would have been very interesting because i mean he's a really sort of key eyewitness here right in in a way that like yeah. this this documentary is probably not going to convince Paul McCartney to be a talking head, right? Because it's probably a bit too small scale. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, that's fair. But Pete would have been a really interesting talking head. You, you never quite know with with Pete uh, because, like, you, you're often told that... Because um, I think... Because he, he had a girlfriend and so, like, when, when everyone was hanging out, he was off kind of hanging out with his girlfriend quite yeah. a lot of the time. But also, you know, Horst Facher talks about this time when John, like, pissed off the balcony of their flat onto the street below uh, because Pete also tells that story you know he corroborates it and he was uh, there like with John and he says that John actually like pissed on some nuns who were walking to church uh, below but yeah I, th- I think it, it may be that Pete is certainly a guy who knew Stuart very well like and, yeah. and he w- would be able to uh, talk in some detail about that you know as evidence as well by the end of the film when astrid talks about their reactions to hearing about his death yeah like she says pete immediately burst into tears yeah yeah um, but now you're right yeah we, we often re- i think relate pete to him playing um in the early uh, days of the beatles career and then his subsequent firing but not actually his take on the other stuff that was happening around that time yeah but it, the other thing the important thing i think for this documentary is this entirely different subset of talking heads just means that there is a little bit of a fresher take in presented in this film. We're not we're not really hearing similar kinds of stories or opinions that we hear in many many other documentaries that sort of retread a lot of the same ground. Yeah, true. Um, 
that said, I think there is probably fair to say that some of what he said in this film is quite controversial. Yep. Or is, dare I say, leaning towards sort of more sensationalist material. Yeah, so there's a couple of fairly well-known theories about Stuart that they go into here. And the documentary is kind of... Can't, not quite saying, but sort of on the side of leaning towards these things are true. So the first one is that the cause of Stu's death, his brain hemorrhage, was caused by a beating he had taken. So it is a matter of kind of established record that in 1961, he took a, a, a kicking from a load of guys in Liverpool and John, I think, it, it rescued him or, or helped him and broke his finger while doing so. There is also a rumour that at some point, John beat him up, and that's you know therefore that caused his brain hemorrhage. I I don't know about any any kind of like established uh, fact about John having beaten him up. Paul and Stuart uh, did have a fight like, on stage. That's kind of established record. That um, and Tony Sheridan talks about it in this film. In fact, doesn't he? Yes. Um, he, he Tony Sheridan implies that the reason for that fight is because Paul quite liked Astrid and was jealous of. The fact that she was with her. Yeah. Again, I don't know how true that is. What Tony does then go on to say, which is where things get a little bit like needlessly cheap and nasty. <laughs> yeah. it, um, Tony uh, Sheridan goes on to say, I can remember Paul and Stuart having a fight over Astrid. Stuart was with, was with Astrid, but Paul would rather it was him. Paul jumps on Stuart and not fighting like a guy, but fighting like a chick. <laughs> but then he also goes Paul would forgive me well no he wouldn't <laughs> but with the claws and everything and he makes like this clawing motion oh, yeah, 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 and it's like <laughs> what what point are you trying to make yeah, like, yeah, it's, yeah. there is a uh, you know uh, without wanting to go off the topic too much but we, we can circle back to this but there is particularly towards the end of the film uh, a quite clear and evident anti-Paul bias I think that the film has yeah. with just a few drop mentions of some things and it's quite. It just comes across quite distasteful, I think. Yeah, a little bit. I like the idea of like uh, Tony Sheridan say, "Oh, like, Paul would forgive me," uh, and then immediately say, "Oh, well, no, he wouldn't." To be honest. Yeah. yeah. But also the, the idea that like Paul's at home in two thousand and five watching BBC Four yes. uh, and just thinking like, "Hang on, I don't yeah. fight like a chick." <laughs> like I'll show him and it's driving around to Tony Sheridan's house and beating him up. Like, but but the the implication there of, that when Tony says, "Paul will forgive me." You'd meant you'd say that if you were talking about a close friend, yeah, and then kind of making like a bit of a sly dig at them, but in like jest, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you in and you, what you're clarifying to the interviewer is, oh, don't worry, like we're on good terms, it's fine, right? I don't believe that <laughs> that Paul's forgiveness of Tony Sheridan, whether that exists or or doesn't exist, is in any way related to any kind of close friendship that the two of them share at that point in 2005. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I have actually no idea whether Paul and Tony Sheridan have any contacts or or anything like that. Although, you know, it, you know, he does have a history with the band. I'm sure they all like... Yeah. Everyone likes him. You know, like, you know, they all got on well, you know. Yeah, um, but, but that, well, that's what makes comments like that and a couple of other comments that Tony makes in this documentary um, all the more surprising because I think he ends up supporting some of the more controversial uh, suggestions that the film makes. Yeah. To dig a bit further into the uh, the point about the, the cause of Stu's death. So the cause of Stu's death was a brain hemorrhage. So there was a post-mortem done, which gave the cause of death as a blood clot on the brain. And the pathologist said that Stuart had suffered a hemorrhage. Uh, I'm sort of uh, uh, paraphrasing, quoting from uh, Tune In by Mark Lewison here. So like Lewison says, Astrid was also told he'd had a rare condition where the size of his brain was gradually increasing and pressing against his skull. So what Lewison says here is, although the association of these two events, talking about Stuart's death and the beating he took in January 1961, although the association of these two events would become an accepted truth, it cannot be more than theoretical. So, you know, maybe sometimes we're sort of in danger of uh, taking absolutely everything in this book as 100% accepted fact. But it is well researched yeah know? of course yeah and um is he's taken like a historian's approach to this thing you know so what this film does is uh so pauline Sutcliffe, stewart's sister who is one of the main talking heads uh in the film says that there was the indication that trauma had caused his death 
I don't know. I mean, listen, this is this is Stuart's sister. You know, there's no, uh, it's, uh, there's certainly no reason for her to make anything up, and I don't think for a second she is. And so, and you can quite rightly make the argument that she knows better than Mark Lewison about this stuff. Yeah, you know, of course, course, yeah, of course. But at the same time, like I, I haven't read anything that says as any kind of accepted fact that his death was caused by head trauma. Uh, mm. and, you know, in fact, it, it does sound like you know he had always been sort of fairly, fairly sickly uh, throughout most of his life. You know, yeah. I think the um, the the other side of that is well is that, uh, and this film does this on a, on a few occasions is that what follows that suggestion is Astrid then immediately shooting it down, yeah, and saying John would never have you know raised a fist against Stu, yeah, um, it just wouldn't happen. That's ridiculous. I feel like this documentary is trying to cover both sides of the story in order to be neutral. Yeah, but by introducing the idea at all, which feels largely unfounded, it kind of doesn't do that job, you know. So they've introduced this idea of uh, potentially uh, John is responsible for Hugh's death because of some violent attack that we don't really know a huge amount about. Yeah, and then quickly covered it off with Astrid saying, "No, that would never happen." Yeah. And then the film moves on to something else, you know. But it's yeah. quite a big suggestion that the film proposes there at that point yeah it does this as well um with uh, another big topic which is when a couple of the talking heads suggest that john and Stu were, had at one point a sexual relationship yeah uh again quite a big suggestion <laughs> yeah. quite, quite you know as as sort of um gossipy quite controversies go that's a bit of a whopper <laughs> and uh, and what happens is the suggestion seems to be based purely on the fact that they were both very close and that they were both and particularly Stuart was sensitive yeah and not much more than that by by their talking heads what, own what, what admission what evidence do you need well, exactly <laughs> and Tony Sheridan says like um who like he says something like oh who knows how far it went and I'm not yeah. uh you know they were, they were very close I'm not interested in what happened after the lights went out <laughs> which is well, don't, I don't mention know, it then yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. Interested, like he yeah. either you know believes it or he doesn't believe it but surely anyone in their right mind knows that just by saying that they are making that implication yeah, of course, and quite deliberately as well. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, but again, like this, this comes from Pauline uh, in the film, where she she says that uh, she had always believed that there had been some kind of sexual relationship between John and Stuart. She never wanted to discuss it when her mother was alive to save her mother's feelings. Uh, because, you know, because not something her mo- her mother would have liked to hear. Uh, but you know, she it, she always felt like that had been the case. I mean, okay. So she also kind of there's a backdrop of like pages from her own book, and it's almost kind of presenting it as as if like the the um, the imagery you're being presented is that oh this has been written about you know mm-hmm. this is this is backed up by like writing. She does say something about like other people have written as yeah. well. And I think yeah yeah what what other people I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He didn't tell me, and John didn't tell me, but other people write about it and they claim that John told them if that gets transposed into oh Stuart and John had homosexual encounters if I say they might have done that's as far as I go it's it's um it's a similar kind of approach to the one about John and Brian that we got in the Brian Epstein story the arena documentary yeah. where there's just you know a bit of rumor and and the talking heads just kind of they just sort of stoke the fire a little bit they just sort of chum the waters a little bit you yeah. know by just saying well you know i mean i don't know for sure but i mean anything's possible it's, it's kind yeah, of really yeah. all they're saying and um, paul was very guilty of that in the brian epstein paul, documentary very guilty of it at the time yeah um yeah i i, I think it's like it's just slightly unedifying you know and and you know this is one of the things about um, the sort of like macho rock star myth. It's just, it, you know, like John Lennon was, it, there was part of him that was a sort of ma- macho rock star. I think he said in the 1980, the David Sheff interview, you know, there's, there's a lot of me that really likes all the macho rock star posturing, you know. And uh, the idea, and he and Yoko said things about, um, 
that they kind of considered themselves bisexual, uh, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, there was certainly a kind of uh, sensitivity to him that belied the kind of rock star myth. But no one ever quite wants to go as far as saying, it, it, yeah, he definitely like had uh, sexual relationships yeah. with, with men. You know, there's it, sort of lots of tiptoeing around the suggestion because it's there's this sort of distasteful cheekiness to sort of dancing around the topic yeah. and, and making sort of these uh, insinuations and having a bit of fun by doing that yeah. without really committing to an actual yeah. claim. Yeah, and actually, like, one of the things these days about Beatle fandom is that particularly, um, you know, we're recording this, like, quite soon after the release of Now and Then. Uh, there's been lots of, like, really lovely uh, fan commentary on social media Particularly from younger fans, who like uh, people who I, I can I assume to be teenagers, um, who are just really, really into the idea that John and Paul loved each other, and are entirely uninterested in whether that was sexual or non-sexual. Yeah, we're just in into the idea. It, it just, they just the idea of like two men loving each other is just is not something they find at all complicated or yeah, something yeah. that needs to be agonized over or like, oh, yeah, but how did they love each other like and, how far did it go you know but, but I, and i think um I, I don't want this to contradict the point you're literally just making but um <laughs> uh, i think my reaction to this being explored in the way that it is in this film is that it, if this film is supposed to be a profile of Stuart Sutcliffe raising this idea which is quite a significant claim to make about a person and doing so in a very sort of unsatisfying way uh, where it's being sort of raised as a potential idea that's kind of just um, teased by a couple of people and then also by the way immediately shot down by Alan Williams the uh, the former Beatles manager who says yes. no they were just close friends yeah. and then the and, film moves on and Astrid as well and Astrid as well yeah, of course yeah. and um, I think you know regardless of the question about whether or not they did have a sexual relationship. The film itself presents it in such a tawdry way yeah. by not giving it any focus. It's almost giving into this uh, need to sort of get some attention yeah. to this idea and this topic without really giving it too much investigation, yeah. um, which just, in my mind, just makes for a very ineffective documentary. Yeah, yeah. I, I will say that like Alan Williams' dismissal of the idea, because I think he says, uh, no, they were just good mates or yes, something like that. Yeah, yeah. But that does seem like something that a man of his generation would yes, just definitely. dismiss because just like yeah. uh, the idea of uh, of two men having a sexual relationship is just so outside my my sphere of experience. Yeah, yeah. I just can't imagine yeah. that, that it would ever happen. No, I do agree with that. And I, yeah, it does feel a bit like they were just good mates and I'm basing that on nothing other than the fact that I would know otherwise, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just didn't seem like it. They just seemed like nice young men, you know? <laughs> that kind of attitude. Yeah, sure, sure. If, if a bit long-haired, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I wonder whether the friendship they had uh, that was based on, uh, you know, they seemed to kind of like bring out the best of each, in each other. Uh, and they do talk like quite nicely at the start of the film about how uh, I think Pauline says like it, it, when Stuart became friends with John, like his friends up until that point had all been like quite parent friendly. Okay? Mm -hmm. You know, you could bring them home and your parents would like them. Uh, and John was the first one who wasn't like, you know, he's, he, you know, he was sort of very rebellious and like l liked stirring things up and was even like quite uh, quite violent at times you know mm. and sort of not the kind of boy who your mother wanted you to hang out with and uh but it does seem that they they had a kind of like shared appreciation of art and music um that really brought out the best of them it seems like a, a really formative friendship and i wonder whether the uh, the sensitivity that, that probably abounded in that friendship uh, whether at the time People didn't really have any better way of framing that as anything other than like, uh, oh, this this must be a sex thing, right? Yeah. You know, it, it may be a bit of that, you know, because it, like it's easy to forget that like at this time in early sixties or was it late fifties they met even or maybe you know I don't know but any, anyway they but, met in fifty nine I believe right okay um, so sort of around this time, bear in mind that e even things like uh, 
like, like hugging a male friend as a greeting was just basically unheard of. Mm. I, I remember like yeah, yeah. remember like Derek Taylor wrote about how when he and his wife had gone to visit the Beatles somewhere and John and George came to meet them and hugged them and said, this is the new thing, hugging your friends. <laughs> don't, you know, don't, this, this would have been what, 67 or something like, yeah. um, you know, don't shake hands, you know, like hug your friends, show them you love them, you know, and Derek Taylor being a, a pretty sort of with it kind of guy uh, was just a bit kind of like, oh, it's a bit weird. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that was 1967, you know, so sort of seven or eight years earlier, that kind of sort of like showing male friends affection was just not done, particularly in a place like Liverpool, right? You know, I think I think one of the nice things that this film does is does suggest at one point that it was Stuart's sensitivity, uh, and and maybe sensitivity ends up becoming the wrong word, uh, maybe like his uh, openness to be creative, yeah, is uh, ultimately rubbed off on John. Uh, and it was Stuart that sort of brought that side out in John, ultimately, that we then see explored throughout the rest of the Beatles' career. Yeah. Which is quite a nice suggestion. And, you know, and if we put stock in that theory, actually puts even more credence on Stuart's contribution to the band as a whole beyond that of just one-time bass player. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, there is... Um... That chapter in Tune In that I was quoting from earlier, I think is called, the name of the chapter is, uh, He Could Have Been The Beatle, hmm. which was uh, a quote uh, made about Stuart. I think the idea was that, you know, the sort of artistic contribution he could have made. Didn't, uh, maybe it was it was probably in the Backbeat episode when we, we were talking about it, where, you know, we sort of said that, well, maybe like Stuart might have gone on to be a sort of artistic collaborator and, you know, played a similar role to Klaus Vormann. Mm. In, yeah, you know, in terms, true. you know, sort yeah. of like designing album covers, um, but also that idea that the Beatles could have been a sort of art collective, as they kind of, you know, showed signs of becoming uh, involved in when they were sort of hanging out with art collectives like the Fool in the yeah. in the in sort of around kind of nineteen sixty seven sixty six. That that's the kind of environment that Stuart might have really thrived in, you mm. know, and and actually that the Beatles were, were not just a musical contribution; uh, they were, a, 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 you know, they made it a cultural and an artistic contribution to the world as well. And he could have been a part of that potentially, or, it, you know, it, it just in my saying that I might be guilty of doing what this documentary does a bit too much of and just framing his uh, life entirely around the like, Beatles. Like, yeah. oh yeah, he he could have gone on and he could have worked with the Beatles. In this yeah, way. Yeah. yeah, or he just would have been a massively successful and brilliant yeah, exactly, painter yeah. and, like, and have had dinner with them every now and again, <laughs> yeah, but never yeah. collaborated with the, them. The really. peaks and successes of his career don't have to be always tied in with the Beatles. Of course, right? yeah. Talent oozed out of him without him doing anything much. And John had to sort of really work hard to make the talent that he had, which was not a, not a little either, but to sort of get it over and say, well, here's my talent too, guys. You know, it was, I think it was a little uh, envious of, of Stuart in that sense. Talking of um, close friendships, we should discuss Rod Murray. Yeah. Who's an uh, old college friend, I think it's Stuart. He's one of the key talking heads in this film. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that this film does with Rod which it always immediately takes me out of any film, is for some reason his contributions to the Stu Sutcliffe story are mostly told whilst he's driving around Liverpool. Yeah. And the camera is positioned, like presumably set up, fixed on him as he's driving around. Yeah. He's not being driven. Like he is watching where he's going. You see him signal in, you know. Yeah. And yeah. I always feel like, why have they made a decision to do that particularly with Rod? I mean, obviously the answer is, he is telling a story about where they used to go when they used to hang out. Yeah. And I think on one occasion in the film, but only one, he actually stops outside somewhere and and mentions, oh, this is a place where we used to go. Yeah. But on the whole, the rest of it is just very different to the other Talking Heads where those interviews are just conducted in a room in their house. <laughs> yeah. you know. And I always feel like, did Rod watch this back and be like, oh, hang on a minute, they make Pauline drive around Liverpool. Why did they make me do that, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's funny that how um, the, the idea of sort of uh, be, being in the place where a thing happened, uh, they parody that in the Ruttles, don't yes, they, right? Yes, they do, it's great. Yeah. Where, like, he's in the car saying, you know, oh, I'm in 
uh, uh, in New York where this happened. Well, not here in the car. Or, yes, you know, not right, in the yeah. car in the city. Anyway, uh, and in the Brian Epstein story, uh, they're sort of standing in the street outside his old house. It's, it's, mm-hmm. I forget. I forget who the talking heads are who are doing that. Maybe it's his former secretary or something like that. I'm for, I forget. I'm afraid. But but the, there is a, a bit of a point made of just like here is where this happened you know and um and with so i think it's gambia terrace where they lived where they had a flat and the other one was percy street so yeah like rod kind of like drives from one to the other and they're more or less on adjacent streets i think and you think okay i mean because what you could have done is just like it not showed any footage of him driving but just shown him like standing in the street outside saying this is where we lived it points up at a window that was john's bedroom or whatever yeah. yeah and then show him walking down the street a bit then cut to him being in the next street doing the same thing again yeah. which is, is it, kind of what they do with horse Macker, right he's yes. in the hamburg and he's like pointing at buildings that's and, right you know, yeah, yeah here's the balcony yeah that john urinated off you know? <laughs> yes uh i forgot to pick you up on that uh earlier when you said about what john did the words that horse actually uses is um he gets wee wee everywhere yes i think or pee pee everywhere or something it's very <laughs> childish strangely childish in his sort yeah, of yeah, thick yeah. german accent it's very odd. right it's, especially for a man who it was apparently a sort of fairly violent gangster <laughs> as well <laughs> yes exactly it's really really odd yeah um the other thing i like about rod is he goes to check out stuart Sutcliffe's guitar yeah he goes to sort of a local museum where it's um stored and I think the implication is that he hasn't seen this guitar. I think what does he say? It's in like 45 years or something. I think something. that's what he says, yeah. But what, was, what I found really interesting about that is, you know, he's about to open the guitar case to look at the guitar. And he basically says, you know, this will tell me whether this is actually the guitar that, that Stuart played. Yeah. And he opens the case and he sees the guitar and he says, yeah, looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. oh is that it like <laughs> it's, again it's one of those moments that we often come across in these films where I feel like the filmmakers are hoping for a bigger, bit of a bigger reaction yeah, and yeah, they're trying yeah. to capture it yeah. but he basically and, and then um, he does the thing where he says um, I've actually got a photo of an old college friend of ours playing this exact guitar mm. and they showed the photo on screen and it's from behind the guy playing it so you can only see the headstock mm. of the guitar and it's not like this is clearly the same guitar right. it's yeah. a bit of like I don't know, like the filmmakers trying to like connect the threads a little bit into <laughs> one scene and actually not quite pulling it off because ultimately they're trying to make a big deal about the fact that, you know, we are now going to visit Stu Sutcliffe's actual original guitar yeah. and actually don't quite give it the um, the, the real event moment in the film that I think they, they're trying to get to. Yeah, that's actually one of the things I really like about Rod Murray. He's a guy like, I'm, I couldn't tell you which ones, but I've seen him in other documentaries but he is not generally popping up in every documentary going. He's not trying to make a name for himself or make any money out of the whole thing. I don't, I don't know. Maybe he did a book at some point. I've no idea. But I, I, I don't, not that I can think of. And I think he's sort of generally happy to be interviewed about. So, you know, he lived with John and Stuart and was an art college friend of theirs. And that's, that's kind of it, you know. But he, yeah. he, he doesn't seem to be always doing the rounds of these things. He seems like a really uh, contented guy who is just he's happy to discuss this, but like it's not the biggest deal in the world. You know? I wonder if that's because when you have films that tell sort of the larger Beatles story, Stuart Sutcliffe, unfortunately, I think, comes off as a bit of a um, peripheral character in that story. Mm. And then if you then extend that to Rod as well, that's almost one step two removed yeah. from the focus of any given film yeah um but obviously this film that makes perfect sense too right because it's just focused purely on Stuart. yeah that's right um another person that i wanted to um, uh, mention your way is alan williams we mentioned him earlier yeah he's someone that i don't feel like we see too often yeah considering what seems to be a very significant title of former beatles manager yeah yeah he's very present in this film yeah but yeah, on the whole, I would suggest that he's a sort of a largely forgotten person in the Beatles story. Well, I, I think I think probably his significance, certainly with sort of books that have been written over the last 20 years or so, has sort of made his contribution a lot clearer. I think maybe there was a bit of a view of him as a bit of a self-promoter for a while. Yeah. Certainly 
in the complete Beatles documentary in which he's he was also a talking head. He did seem to be putting himself at the center of things a bit too much, you know. But but listen, this guy was their manager and he was responsible for getting them to Hamburg, you know. And there was an argument that if they didn't go to Hamburg, they wouldn't have uh, got as good as they were and they wouldn't have made it. And they would, you know, and like maybe they wouldn't have got a record deal at all and they would have been forgotten about, you know. Uh, the importance of Alan Williams is. It is undoubted. Um, but yeah, it, it's, I think maybe there was a period when there were documentaries being made. Because let, let bear in mind, when we talked about the complete Beatles, we were talking about how this was, what, 20 years after their first single. It was 1982, I think it was. And uh, that was a point at which there was a bit of a renewed interest post John's murder in people watching documentaries about the Beatles. It was probably thought before then there wasn't much of an audience mm. for it. And so at that point, Alan Williams was a guy who probably had been forgotten about a bit and was like only too willing to, quite quite reasonably and rightly, go in documentaries and say, actually, yes, I did, I did this stuff. And, I, you know, I was a significant part of the early days of the Beatles. I think the, the other side of it, as well is that I tend to find in these documentaries that the uh, the people they're interviewed tend to fall into one of two camps, which is sort of trusted Beatles insider and friend of the band, and someone who's willing to sort of toe the the Apple line, as it were. And then there are loose cannons, <laughs> 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 uh, and I feel like. Alan Williams, like there's, you know, a couple of things that he says in this, he, he mentions quite almost offhandedly, this is the first time that the band had their first bout of gonorrhea. <laughs> yes, good. It's one yeah. of the things yeah, he yeah, says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He also, um, quite interestingly, talks about uh, when he was sacked as their manager, and he, he sort of quite pointedly says that John refused to pay me commission. Mm, yeah. and, and to be fair, he ends up turning that into a quite a self-deprecating joke where he says, you know, well, you, you guys will never work again. And actually it was me that never worked again, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is fair to him for that. But yeah, it, it, he does seem like the kind of character in, in these stories where he can't necessarily be, be trusted to to upkeep the what the band might want to keep as a uh, squeaky clean image. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. As well, I suppose he he would have seen quite a lot of stuff. Actually, I don't. I mean, so Alan Williams kind of took them took them there, um, but then went home. You know, so yeah, like, oh, he yeah, went yeah. back so, to Liverpool. Okay, so I don't think he it sort of stayed there with them. Certainly not for any significant amount right, of okay. time. So, so uh, actually, so former Beatles manager implies sort of like an ongoing management of their services and you know affairs. He, he he was so I think to be fair it is it, it is acknowledged pretty much universally that he was officially their manager right okay. like they they what contract they signed or whatever I don't know sure but he he describes himself as such and the others like Paul in the anthology mentions him as you know we had a manager at the time who was really good for us at the time yeah yeah sure you know? okay apart from that he let us all get gonorrhea presumably. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That is a, yeah, that is a, a detail that, like a lot of other details, is not mentioned in the Beatles <laughs> anthology. <laughs> Just quickly, as a quick aside, there's, there's a moment in this film around the same time where the narrator talks about the band first uh, arriving in Hamburg and there is uh, a shot of the crowd and the the idea being this is the crowd at a Beatles gig, right? right. I don't know if it is or not. Uh, but the narrator then says um, that sex was freely available. As he says this, the camera sort of focuses it in on one girl's face in the crowd, who's just there enjoying a gig. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like like has she now a grown woman now watched this back and been like, well, hang on a minute, I was there once, I saw a live band, had a great time, went home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you zoomed in on my face while saying that sex was freely available. It was really odd. Yeah, right. Yeah. And and also <laughs> I'm now like seventy years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm watching this with my grandchildren saying that I used to know those guys. Um yeah, just a, I thought what an unfair choice to make. <laughs> very true actually it's like it's sort of talking of the narration so the narrator is uh, paul morley 
who was uh, an NME journalist uh, and sort of mm. wrote for various uh, publications, and also is a guy who has done a, a lot of sort of music documentary work. You know, yeah. he's, it, yeah. like it, like BBC Four documentaries. In fact, like m- most Saturday nights, you will see a, a music documentary in which Paul Morley is a talking head. He's second only to Gambaccini, really, like in, <laughs> yeah. in, in in those stakes. Um, but he like he says a few things in it. So listen, I don't, I don't know whether he wrote his uh, narration or not, but like, uh, but there are a few things he says that whether the the big generalizations and and he says them and then that's and then they move on and it's you know and it's kind of and it's the sort of thing that just a lot like some of the more sensationalist claims that are made in this film you kind of think that um it, it's dealt with so quickly that it just kind of like goes under the radar and yeah. you can see how these things would just become accepted fact um so you, you know one thing he says is that right at the start um, he says something about like the the early success of the Beatles wasn't just down to Liverpool charm or the volatile relationship between John Lennon and Paul McCartney, but dot dot dot. And you think, oh, hang on, was was their relationship volatile in the yeah. early days? I yeah, don't think so. Particularly was it? later on, maybe yeah. But like um, he also says right right at the very end when he um, the cover Stu's death, I think how he as a narrator wraps up uh, what happens immediately after that. I wrote this down. He says, um, Stu's death really crushed John, forcing him to turn to Paul for artistic and emotional truth yeah. until he couldn't even rely on that when yeah. he turned to Yoko. Yeah, 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 and I just thought, like, what a weird way to completely gloss over the most successful songwriting partnership in history. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I, he turned to Paul for, for artistic and emotional truth and then he couldn't even rely on that. And it's like, they, they had a very successful career together. Yeah. What an odd, uh, odd phrasing. I, I would think so. Like, given the time period, so it's two thousand and five, and given that it's Paul Morley, I would imagine. I don't want to misrepresent him because I am because I'm not. I, I haven't read or can't remember reading Paul Morley writing about the Beatles, but I would bet he's a Lennon guy mm. and he's a Paul is a lightweight guy. Maybe maybe he's not anymore. I don't know, but certainly that would have been a popular opinion at the time. Yeah, and he is very much from a school of enemy journalism from like the early 80s yeah uh who would have been very into that idea i think there was um there, there's a bit early on as well where um uh i think it's the narrator saying this but he says that when when Stu first starts seeing astrid and he says um that he started living with astrid and painting and he kept missing band practice and then he says which infuriated paul yeah and it's and and maybe that's true, but there, there were just a number of digs like this at Paul throughout yeah. the film, and yeah. particularly towards the end uh, of the film. It, yeah, it just it starts to add up to quite a negative picture, like a deliberately deliberately negative picture, uh, and that bias becomes really obvious. Yeah, I think so. So I think it is fair to say that Paul was frustrated at Stu's bass playing ability. These days, I think it's. Uh, it's sort of more widely accepted that Stuart was a sort of better bass player than he was often depicted as. Mm -hmm. Um, But certainly like he was not a natural musician and uh, Paul wanted the Beatles to be (laughs) good musicians, not not unreasonably like, and and was into the musicianship and the craft of it, you know, and certainly he, he was a bit more of a sort of general virtuoso player than John or George. I think it's probably fair to say. And I, I have read that the fight that he and Stuart had on stage was actually about Stuart Stuart's sort of incompetence on the bass, mm. you know, which it seems like a quite a petty thing to get into an actual physical fight with about yeah, someone because yeah. he would played C sharp by accident, <laughs> you know. So yeah, it, it does kind of add up to that sort of picture of Paul as being a bit of a perfectionist and mm. things. Um, should also be said that uh, apparently, like by all accounts, those sort of Certainly, the first trip to Hamburg, Paul was sort of the least popular of them, and I think so. Like there were lots of evidence that in letters and things, I think Stuart kind of wrote home and said, "Well, Paul seemed he's sort of he's the one who everyone's kind of shunning and ignoring a bit, and he you know he's sort of out of the the gang a bit, that kind of thing." I think Paul also said about Stuart's death. I mean, much much later. I mean, but it said like you know. It was the tough thing was that like when Stuart died was that I didn't like him very much, you know, and but I never got the chance to say 
I'm sorry about that. Like, you mm. know, we were, we were kids and it wasn't that important, but you know, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. So uh, I, I think that there's a, there's a difference in my mind between the, the actual events that the film is telling and the way that it expresses them. Because yeah. I think that when we're talking about there being a bias with Paul, when the narrator says that, you know, uh, Stu missing band practice or whatever it was, uh, in infuri- which infuriated Paul, what the film isn't then doing that is qualifying that statement with who was a bit of a, perfe- of a perfectionist right. in his approach to the band's music, yeah. you know, which is all it takes. Yeah. And I think the, the sort of having that remark deliberately clipped at a, at a point where it's sort of suggesting that Paul was a bit of a hard person to be around is, is where that bias comes through because it's deliberately not doing Paul any favours. Yeah, it does seem that way, doesn't it? Um, yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't come off that great. It does seem like the sort of documentary where he doesn't seem to have a lot of right to reply. No, or, yeah. well, I mean, you know, I'm sure if they if, 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 if they'd asked him, if they asked, you know, uh, you know, he. Um, but yeah, no, I'm sure it's uh, it, it's not the sort of documentary that he would have appeared on uh, no. ne- necessarily. But yeah, it does seem a bit like people are like. Uh, well, no, no one's kind of sniping at him necessarily, but he is getting slightly short shrift. Yeah. You know. Obviously, one main talking head in this film that we haven't really spoken about much is Astrid herself. Yeah, and, yeah. And I think one of the film's strengths is that it does uh, go out of its way to emphasise the significant contribution that she made to the Beatles and, the, and obviously the Beatles' image yeah. uh, at the time, which I think is, I, I, I don't want to say uncharacteristically nice of the film, but <laughs> it does seem to sort of um, explore that in a bit more detail than uh, other areas in the film, which is quite nice to see. Yeah, I think, you know, she and... It's always nice to see uh, Klaus Forman as well, because like he, yeah. uh, like Klaus, Klaus is a pretty regular talking head on Beatle Beatle documentaries, um, but he really seems to just have his head screwed on. Again, he's not sort of promoting himself, you know, mm. and uh, so it's always nice to see him. But yeah, Astrid is kind of you, you. You don't see her all that much, you know, and she, you know, pa- passed away a couple of years ago now. But yeah, you, you didn't used to see her all that much in general. And yeah, I think um, she's very, very calm and level-headed presence in mm. this film. So certainly where claims are being made, she seems uninterested in... So some of them she just kind of dismisses, but also she's not really making any grand claims of her own. Yeah, She's talking quite uh, simply and quite sweetly about Stuart. She said one of the really lovely things she said that quite surprised me, actually, was she said, oh, I actually still have a picture of him on my bedside table, mm. which was lovely given that she would be, what, h- how long? So 45 years or so since he sure. died, we're yeah, talking yeah, about yeah. here. But with the, and that's a really nice detail. But the, I, I really got the impression that she was quite a significant figure to them. We kind of know that, that the Beatles were able to sort of go to her house and, and sort of wash there because they didn't really have yeah. like, and sort of get a, a good meal and stuff, you know. I actually like when when I went to Hamburg, I did that walk right. from the Grosser Freiheit up to Astrid's house, and you, you walk it in. I remember thinking, oh, it's quite a long walk, uh, but it was, it was sort of twenty five minutes or something right, like okay. that. Yeah. But you do uh, you do very much get the sense on that walk that you are going from a, a sort of gro- this was d- during the daytime, so Grosser Freiheit. Is, is really just, uh, you know, it's, it's perfectly normal and safe to walk down. But obviously, like, in, in the evening, it's a lot seedier and stuff, mm, you know. Sure. But you do get the impression that you're walking from a sort of slightly grimy downtown area into a, 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 no, a really nice middle-class area. And right. you, you can see that the Beatles would have been quite impressed by this, you yeah. know, and, and thinking like, oh, okay, this is a this is a decent place, you know. And uh, and looking at the house, it, you can, get, you know, to the extent you can't go in or anything, but like, you know, they wouldn't let me for some reason. <laughs> but, um, the, uh, but, you know, you, you can kind of, you can see like this is a nice place, you know. But I, I think she had a kind of, I think there was a, a, a sort of mothering thing going on towards all of them. And I, you get the impression from uh, from other sources and also from this film that everyone fancies her yes, like you know it's yeah. like to- tony sheridan says something like it yeah she was you know, the kind of person who like you know 
it, you know, she could just say one thing and like really light up your day or something yeah. like that. And my understanding was she didn't actually speak an awful lot of English and Stuart didn't speak lots of German mm. uh, and that they actually couldn't communicate very well with each other. But but everyone, but I don't know, may, maybe everyone learned quickly or, yeah, or, yeah, or whatever, or they were using translate, translators or, or whatever it was, I don't know. But, um, but yeah, you get the impression. That, so there's a claim made that sort of uh, Paul fancied her and that was the source of some jealousy with him and Stuart. Stuart obviously fancied her. Like backbeat is kind of certainly suggesting that John fancied her. Yeah. And uh, let's let's throw George in as well. He probably did. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? You know. Probably Pete. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Yeah. You know. Um, the other thing is always you know going back to that uh, question about the anti-Paul bias as well. She's the only one who says anything nice about Paul, which is that uh, when she talks through how she breaks the news of Stu's death to the band, she yeah. says that Paul just held me in the kind of beautiful way that he does. Yeah. Uh, which is quite a sweet description to give. The uh, Incidentally, actually, the other thing about that part of, of the film is that she does tell us uh, in that moment that George Harrison knew about Stu's death before the others, which is quite interesting, an interesting detail. Yeah. Um, purely because he travelled over on the plane with Stu's parents. Yes. I think his relatives. So he would have known about the news from that first, whereas... Uh, Astrid told the rest of the band when they arrived at the airport. Yeah, yeah. I believe. And then she goes on to talk about John's reaction, which is quite, I guess, in keeping, I think, of what we know of John. It seems quite quite a sort of a, a manic and unpredictable, you know, grief-stricken moment for him. Yeah, yeah, I've heard sort of a few different accounts of this. So, like, I think she says the most popular one seems to be that he kind of, like, laughed hysterically in a uh, sort of laughter that was that turned into tears mm. or where, where like, you know, the laughter and the tears were essentially the same thing. I think, uh, I think Paul actually disputes that slightly and says, no, that wasn't quite his reaction, but he did flip out or, or yeah. something like that. Um, Pete Best as well, I think said that he, uh, that he did just sort of flip out in the airport in some way. Right. I forget. I, like, th- these are not wildly differing accounts. Yeah, that's but true. The, yeah, but the idea true. of, um, the idea of like, oh, I, I, my best friend is dead, and my reaction is to laugh. That you, that sometimes you do. It's you know, it's, it's a nervous reaction when you can't quite believe something. Yeah, yeah. To laugh, you know. And, I think uh, I think there are all reasonable ways to react. You know, with sort of sharp and sudden grief. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, and also, they can all be true. Yeah. They're, they're not too wildly differing. Uh, accounts are they yeah yeah um and i think this film goes to great pains to show us and tell us that john and Stu had a very singular friendship so it kind of is in keeping with that yeah and and i think it's making suggestions at the start that john was very deeply affected by Stuart's death and i'm, sh- I'm sure he was it would be it, 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 it'd be odd if he wasn't in a way you know as mm-hmm. i said like he had been affected by an abnormal amount of death in his young life um there, there's a scene there's a sort of montage scene right at the start of the film where they're using footage of john skiing and it must be from help i guess yeah um and i, and I guess it must be and i don't think he's dressed up in the sort of help the clothing he was wearing in that scene in help so i think it must be when they were rehearsing or practicing skiing or something like that but anyway um and you think well that's, that's an odd choice why are you showing him skiing and then because uh, he's face is quite you can you can see that he's cold his face is kind of like quite ruddy and and he looks sort of uh slightly worn down he's obviously like slightly tired because he's been skiing and he's also they're sort of using little um uh, it, it, like a bit of video but it also just kind of turns into still images and the still images are, are generally him looking worn out haggard and sort of looking off into the distance but almost it is as if sort of looking around for someone who he thought would be there and you know and i suppose like what it's trying to do is kind of hint that that is Stuart that he's yes. thinking about not not in any absolute or literal way and the music it's using there's a live version of this boy that it's using and uh and specifically uh, the line this boy wants you back again is sung while we're sort of seeing these images of john so it's it's certainly uh, making that suggestion that this was that Stuart's death left a big hole in his life. Yeah, I mean, there is one of those instances in that moment is him framed very much to the left 
um, with sort of like a, a big space next to him. And yeah. he's, he's almost looking at the space. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it's it's very much indicating that there is a, that hole that you're talking about there is very yeah. much visually represented in that in that yeah. moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're right. The, the, the use of the music is actually quite interesting throughout the, the uh, documentary, actually, because I think the film starts with Love Me Do, and then you have that live version of This Boy. Uh, and then, and there are moments in the film where it plays Love Me Tender, which yeah. is a reference to Stu singing that live uh, to Astrid. Yeah. Um, but then right at the end of the film, it sort of pulls Jealous Guy out of nowhere, yeah. which is, uh, yeah. and I'm, I'm still I was just left a little bit baffled as to why that particular song choice was made, because it's not really related to the, the period don't think it, it sort of you know lyrically uh ties to anything that's happening in the film at, at the moment that it's played mm. so yeah it's sort of a strong strong sort of, other than the fact that it's sort of tonally right it's a you know mm. it's a it's a relatively melancholic song yeah uh maybe that's all there is to it but yeah some some sort of stranger choices made there yeah i think i think that is probably the extent of it uh and you're right that like to- tonally it's it, it works mm. um but uh, this it, it's also sort of uh, over a backdrop of some drawings that i think are by klaus foreman um uh, that are uh, that's a, a picture of john in sort of anguish you know yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of drawings by klaus throughout it depicting things like uh when sort of Paul and Pete were locked up in a jail cell after, uh, right. the, you know, being arrested for arson and all that kind of stuff, um, which are nice and like you know they illustrate the whole thing well. Um, but I th- it, so I mean the the version of Love Me Do at the start is a live version, and then this boy is a live version, which suggests to me that it's that they could get the rights to that. Yeah. Throughout it, there are lots of general rock and roll songs that have been played by a. Uh, what we're told in the credits is a band called the Prellies, uh, which is a reference to the Preludin, uh, which is one of the uppers that they took uh, to keep themselves awake when they were performing in Hamburg, which they uh, used to call Prellies. So the, it, the band being called that suggests that it's probably session musicians who were put together in order to do a soundtrack. Yes. For this. And then Jealous Guy. And, and you're right, it's a strange song. So I presume like, Jealous Guy is the studio version. It's easier to get the rights to use John Lennon things than it was to use Lennon and McCartney things. Yeah. So that would have played a big part. But yeah, I mean, maybe in terms of sort of solo John Lennon songs that uh, that you want to convey a certain mood. But bear in mind, a lot of it is quite on the nose. Yeah. yeah you know, sure. like Mother. And, yes. <laughs> and, and, yeah, you know, you're right. Yeah. Like where, where like there's certainly anguish in his singing but he's specifically singing about his mother being dead, and so it just doesn't fit yes. it enough, you know. Yeah, but I, I think that's my point about jealous guy. It feels, you know, right. that you know, I'm just a jealous guy. Yeah. Like the the uh, the the narrative of that song again. I know we always come back to this question, but the narrative of that song doesn't necessarily fit with what I think the film is trying to say at that time. No, like, who's jealous of who when that song's playing? Right, that's, just, that's what I I don't get. Yeah, I don't know. And well, uh, talking of giving up, <laughs> that's probably a good uh, a good point at which to end the discussion. As always, we would love to hear from you if you have seen the film at all, if you have any thoughts on Stuart Sutcliffe and his role in the band. Please reach out to us and contact us on any of the social media platforms. We are at Beatles Films Pod. Uh, also, if you're interested in any of the other films we've referenced in this uh, episode so far, we have covered a lot of Beatles films in the past we've recorded episodes talking about Help and Yellow Submarine Magical Mystery Tour as well as some of the others we mentioned earlier the Brian Epstein Arena documentary most recently the Complete Beatles George Harrison Material World Uh, we've covered them all please feel free to explore our back catalogue of episodes and give those a listen and if you like any of those episodes or if you've enjoyed listening to this episode uh, we would really appreciate it if you could give us a five star rating or a review. It really helps other people to find us and we can help grow the uh, the Beatles Films pod community. Otherwise, we'll see you again next week for another episode. And until then, bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>